Uh, that's actually a can. Uh, this is the NeoBooks call on Monday, March 4th, 2024. Uh, and we were just talking about some of the Zoom features. Uh, sorry, yeah, Pete, you were going to explain? Uh, it's confusing that AI Companion and the AI Summary are different things. I've, yes. I've confused them before. And so Smart Recording is on, but, I, but I'm not getting a summary now. So I don't know actually how to turn on the AI Summary. The, the way I do it, and and we've we're different. Um, if you somewhere on the the bottom buttons, uh, you can say start summary, which is how I've been doing it. I I started doing the call. For me, cool. it's next to share screen and AI companion. What's the me... difference between companion? Oh, companion is something that you can ask questions of during the call. Um, oh. So, and and the idea is. Oh, I joined the call late. Uh, so instead of interrupting everybody and saying, what did I miss? You can ask the AI companion, what did I oh. miss? Or did, you know, did Sherry share that thing that she was going to talk about or whatever? You know, that's the theory. I've never played with it. So I've enabled it, which means uh, later in the call, you could use AI companion. I'm not entirely sure how, but that's right. You could basically quiz it about our meeting. <clears throat> for what that's it's great. Worth. Too bad we don't know what it's for. <laughs> For what it's worth, when I click AI Companion, it says ask host to start AI Companion. So it thinks and it's not started yet. AI Companion should be on. Welcome to AI I, Companion. I oh, I see. Um, after starting. So I'm going to start it. Now it says uh, I got a thing that says it's on. Good. So I just turned on four things for fuck's <laughs> sake. <laughs> so the other odd thing is I don't get summaries with the recording in the Zoom recording files. I get the the summary in my email separately. yes which is how i was getting it before it wasn't one of the downloadables and i was just saving it as as a pdf and then attaching it with the other files when i upload them to our channel and matter the, the, the formatting of that is I, I i using a pdf is a good way to share it i've been wanting i i put it in into wiki pages but to do that i have to like copy it into like plain text and then rebold the headers and ah uh, ah uh. Pain. Hey, Dave. Hey, Chris. I'm glad to have you here. I I have started a 30 minute timer so we can circle back around and ask the AI companion what the summary was so we could see the thing in live action and Perfect. figure out if, in fact, we could just sit here and talk about a book <laughs> and have the AI write the book for us. Awesome. I like that a lot. How meta. We could just, we could just talk, talk the book and, through. And so we won't, we'll, we'll ask it for a summary, but we'll also ask it some, some like particular questions. You know, what did Chris say? Um, what did Stacy say? What did, you know, what are the, the, I don't know, something like that. Did we talk about, uh, I, it, it's funny, I can't mention a thing, a, a topic that we might talk about because yeah, yeah. that'll spoil the. <laughs> like a anyway. plot spoiler. Um, cool. How is, how is everybody this bright and beautiful morning? Although it's turned back into winter in Portland. Um, I, I, I got home from a junket lot late last night. Uh, very interesting. I, I figured I, I can say this on the recording, but I sort of figured out the plot, although it took me a long time and a little investigating. I was like, who's, who's funding this and why? Like, what's the deal here? And I'm pretty sure now that this was a PMI junket. Anybody recognize the initials PMI? Wow. Private mortgage insurance. I'm sure that's not what it is. <laughs> that is not it. Which other PMI? Right. That's a project management institute, I believe. There is uh, that. It's not that one either. Uh, so without the Googling. Presidential management fellows known as PMS. I don't know. Yep, yep. It. Nobody's got okay. You, you can Google if you must. Pete, you probably Googled it immediately. Um, I'm I'm asking ChatGPT what's the great circle distance from Oregon to uh... oh <laughs> <laughs> to Bahrain. I, I figure you're going to tell us uh, tell us what PMI is. So PMI is the reformulated Philip Morris International. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. And so my my current take on the plot of the weekend was is they are sponsors of Ferrari because we had a paddock club club 
right above the Ferrari paddock, uh, the Ferrari garage rather. Um, and as part of the, so we got to attend the, the Bahrain Grand Prix. Uh, I was on a panel on Friday, no, Saturday, yeah, Friday morning. I was on a panel and that was my duty. And it was a short panel about AI, uh, sorry, about the metaverse. <clears throat> I was the skeptic on the panel. Panel went great. Everybody was asking me questions throughout the weekend. It, that worked really well. It was it was like wait, just too short a panel, but it was conversations the whole weekend. But it's kind of the quid pro quo was, hey, you get to attend the, the Bahrain Grand Prix, which is the first Grand Prix of the season. They have all new cars. I am not a big F1 fan and I've never attended a car race. So I kind of started at the top with VIP treatment at, at the like first Grand Prix. And it was it was a pretty memorable event, but but it took me a while to figure out the plot. So I I basically was a beard for Philip Morris, <clears throat> um, which <laughs> seems to be trying to switch itself to a smokeless company and seems to be doing pretty well on that and be earnest about it. But but nobody was that upfront about the whole plot. So it was it was very interesting. Really um, cool. but, and the attendees, I have no idea how they picked them. I don't think any of them paid anything. PMI Philip Morris spent lots of dough on this weekend. They like whenever you showed up for a meal, there was food for a hundred people, but we're only like 40. And I was like, who who can eat all this? What's what's going on here? Was that uh, just quantity or was it also variety? Uh, varieties too. Yeah, yeah. We we went to a, a, a Asian restaurant for dinner Friday night, Saturday night. Friday night, because I traveled all day Sunday to get home. Um, and there were like five stations, one of which was like 10 steam trays. <clears throat> so the crazy, crazy wild variety of foods. <sighs> I don't understand. Oh, and then uh, uh, Saturday night after everything was over, after the race, there was a party and the DJ, I'm not even going to remember his name <laughs> but the dj is like famous famous and is the uh, hold on a second let me let me find it uh uh ba -da -ba -da. like if you pull up dj Khaled and like that's the guy like yeah not that one no I'll mark be i'll be disappointed <laughs> so so mark ronson who is the, the guy who did uptown funk and a bunch of other stuff including a couple people's albums whom you would recognize yep. so he he was he just shows up starts djing and I'm like, I sort of know his name. And I had him in my brain already. I like, like I kind of knew who Mark Ronson was, but I didn't really know. So, and and the Bahrain is almost 12 hours opposite us. It was, you know, I basically would add an hour. If it was 6 p.m. over there, I would add an hour and turn a.m. to p.m. And I had the right local time in, on the West Coast. <clears throat> so it was always way, kind of fun. By the way, avoid Istanbul's new airport. They have a brand new gigantor airport uh, that replaces the Atatürk airport. And it's A, it's huge, but B, it's one of those airports that's nothing but a luxury mall in the middle. Like you have to walk past acres of Chanel everybody. And I'm like, this crowd doesn't look like the luxury shopping crowd. I don't know what you're doing here exactly. Um, and then there are no seats. Like, like seating, I had a four and a half hour layover. I ended up sitting on the floor in a, 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 for a while because there was just no seating. Very weird. How do you build an airport with no seats? Like I, how, it, maybe that's how you charge more for the plane. There were there were a couple seats, but really it, not, you, not. You want them enough. circulating and buying stuff. Bingo! That's exactly the plot I deduced. There, it's like, oh, okay, don't let them sit, so they have to float into the stores, and eventually they'll buy something. And I sat down to have a meal. I sat down and so I ate some food and then I should have I should have kept that seat. <laughs> should have just sat there for four hours. Would have been good. By the time I got, by the time they assigned me a gate and I walked out to the gate, which was a long hike, at the gate there was seating and the only plug that I found. So I could recharge, my, my devices were thirstily slurping up uh, some electrons. Anyway, sorry for the long digression, but it was a, it was a memorable weekend because uh, we got a bunch of funny little things. Uh, at some point, I'm talking to a, a guy that a really, really nice guy in, in the little suite we have. And he says, oh, there goes Verstappen. So we bolt outside to the long hallway that runs outside all the suites. We go next door and there's Verstappen being interviewed on stage about 10 feet from me. And this is Max Verstappen of the Red Bull team who won the race 
by walking away from everybody else. So in, in the race, uh, which is like 57 laps or something like that, you watch as kind of every every couple minutes, he adds a second to his lead over his teammate who is in an identical car <clears throat> and over everybody else who is in inferior cars. And, and you're like, okay, wow, how did they do this? Uh, anyway, it was memorable for many different reasons, including not liking Istanbul's airport. Speaking of uh, big uh, global multinationals, I I have a, a theory, which might be a conspiracy theory. Excellent. Or might not. Um, and it starts in an odd place. Uh, it starts in mid-journey. Mid-journey is uh, one of the best image, you know, AI image generators. Um, it's best because it makes beautiful images, like the one behind me, actually. Um, so I noticed something funny and it, and it popped when, well, I noticed something funny. Um, the way I get Midjourney to make pretty images is I, is I give it nonsense prompts. Like I can also like say, you know, make a pretty picture and blah, blah, blah. A lot of times I'm just like literally random words and stuff like that. So it's free associating uh, amazingly cool images. And then I pick the best ones and do stuff with them. So I've, I seem to have noticed, or, or it feels to me like um, a number of the images, like, uh, like here's a neighborhood market, or here's a 1950s gas station kind of rusted out or whatever. It seems like over and over, a lot of those will have the Coca-Cola uh, logo. <laughs> So the one where I got, there was a neighborhood market and it had like three refrigerator cases and Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. And then it had Coca-Cola on, on a front cash register, you know, uh, station. I'm like, if I were Coca-Cola and I were the marketing team for Coca-Cola and I were, and I knew that mid journey was generating millions of images every day, I would like walk over to them with a big bundle of cash and say, could you make the Coca-Cola logo pop up like a little bit more than it should? And, you know, wouldn't that be a cool thing for, for us to do that together? Especially if you had these briefcases full of cash, I would totally do that. And so now I wonder if that's what's happening. So could it also be a reflection that Coke has advertised so much in the world that the world is wallpapered with their logo? It, it totally could. And the training it, it set, the training set is basically the, the biased toward data. whoever advertised the most. So this is a this is an unexpected dividend of Coke's insane marketing budget. Um, or it could uh, be, or it could be that or, juiced, they've juiced know, the deal. Uh, um, I haven't noticed the same thing with Red Bull, for instance. Right. I would think that I would see Red Bull nowadays more than I would see Coke. But really, I oh, Coke. I, I don't, I don't, the history I don't know of the Coke <laughs> iconography, you know, I don't know. I mean. I remember um, like hitchhiking through the Kalahari and there were coke yeah, yeah, yeah. on the side it's of all it, over the place. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. Go ahead, Stacey. So what stands out most for me, especially after your share, Jerry, is if economic inequality isn't held as one of the foremost things to work towards fixing, we don't stand a chance. And I just want to say last week I was in San Antonio with um Kevin's Neighborhood Economics Conference. Oh, cool. It was wonderful. And what I noticed most, and this has to do with really the resonance of the people there, this was a group of people whose agenda is to elevate the people on the bottom. That, cha that changes everything. Now, I'm not saying every single person in there had that, but the, the, the largest percentage of people were coming in like that and it changes everything. And uh, yeah, I just want, I'll let him talk more about it, you know, but I, we need to really focus on the things that we're supporting and make sure that they're moving in that direction because that absolutely, if that doesn't change, nothing else will. I love yeah. that you went, go ahead, Pete. If I may, Stacey, when, what are some examples for you of when it changes everything? What are some of the things you think it changes? You, or you, well, for, you know example, that it changes. for example, Jerry gets invited to this wonderful junket. 
I mean, I can't put words to it. It's just obvious. <laughs> how does uh, how do you think um, focusing on on the disadvantaged? How do you think that how how does that change? Well, it's not about focusing on the disadvantage. It's about coming up with systems that the systems itself are focused on the flow of material goods so that it's less easy to corrupt based on human nature because the system is built to look out for that. Yeah, that's really cool. I, was th I mean, I, Stacey, I don't know if it's the same thing, but I was thinking that there, uh, it, there's a very different experience working in a sector with money versus a sector without money. So like my wife spends a lot of time in the healthcare sector. And so her events, you know, are, are lavish. And, you know, like I'm thinking about regeneration and our events are not lavish. And it's, and it's, there's something about, you know, and I think in economic principles, it's kind of, uh, what do you, what do you it's, it's first mover advantage or, or there's a, you know, a stickiness to it or kind of. And so like one of the, like in, in California now, they're trying to use uh, Medicaid money to pay for housing, right? which makes a lot of sense, except that means it'll kind of go through the insurance companies. But it makes sense because that's where the money is. And it doesn't make sense because why would you have like the medical system managing housing, you know? But anyway, you just end up with all kinds of weird distortions and stuff. So I, I feel like it's a version, another, just another lens on this, on a similar issue that you're talking about. Well, and that was just one other thing I'll say is at the conference, it was, the, most of the people there realize that it's a systems approach. So housing does affect health and health does affect housing. And going back to the lavish, I'm all for lavishness, but it should be forever. I mean, I believe in abundance. So I'm not against it being lavish. I just want to open up the flow of who gets to experience that. And, and neighborhood economics seems like they're doing a good job of it. I think they're doing an excellent job of it. And so if, if I were designing the world, I would be giving them financial support to give away what they have for free so they don't have to charge people to get their knowledge. That's what I'd like to see. That's the, the shift I'd like to see. So how do we shift, how do we shift funding of stuff so that the thing I just went to, which was clearly overfunded, um, get doesn't happen as much, and and the money actually gets shifted to worthwhile local ventures because there's this like starvation versus plen like like gluttony kind of problem. I don't have an answer for that, and I don't even focus my attention there. I focus on like who we are and who I am. Like I think I heard through the grapevine that Jordan got some funding. I would say Jordan maybe should look at Kevin and maybe fund him instead of asking Kevin what he could do for him. Well, there we are. Anyone, <laughs> anyone else with thoughts on this topic? Because we've uh, we've been philosophizing for a bit here. Uh, Jose, just to catch you up. By the way, Jose, if you wanted to catch up on what we've been talking about, you could just try the AI Companion. Uh, just at the bottom of the screen, there should be a little thingy that says AI Companion. You click on that. It gives you a window with a couple of prompts. And you could say, catch me up on the conversation and see what happens. Actually, is, we encourage you to do it and maybe is, share is, it with us. Which is yet yet another digression, but hey, uh, that's we, worthwhile. We we it's were like giggling great, about this at the top of the call. Catch me up is great. Catch me up is really great. It, it missed your whole uh, uh, analysis of AI, though. I, I think there may be another conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, AI, I it's this other that. AI. It's not me. I'm, I'm yeah, not yeah. going to tell you about it. It's a self-centered AI companion, which it only wants to talk about it. It talks about the Grand Prix and it. And then they talked about me and then I'm no, it AI. I, everything about AI has been dropped out of here. Wow. Uh, I So I asked, did Coke come up? And I said Coke. I didn't say Coca-Cola. Yep. Um, it actually is. No, nope, it doesn't mention Coke by name. 
I don't know, so, but, but it, it says yes. Coca Cola is mentioned in the meeting transcript. Uh, participants noticed that many. Oh, if you ask, I see. So you yeah. can ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He asked. It did a great uh, job. In the version, summary I've got, there's none of that. Yeah, on my version of Catch Me Up, it mentions the Coca Cola logo appearing. Wow. So. So everybody's getting a slightly different version of Catch Me Up too. It sounds like. Which, which is one of the things about AI language things, especially uh, you want to have a conversation with it. You don't want to ask it one question. Hmm. But it's still prioritizing. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it puts things, it puts stuff yeah. in my summary. It, it decides, yeah. I said, Jerry, my, one of my reactions to your framing is it's a scarcity framing. Mm -hmm. So how do we, sh how do we shift from money from that sector to the sector? Yeah. Um, which may be so here, here's harder the, here's, because here's, funny is funding is sticky, you know, kind mm -hmm. of it's like it's kind of like saying, why, you know, we have an empire that why is Vienna still wealthy looking, right? Well, it, it was wealthy, really wealthy once, and it's still kind of wealthy. Mm -hmm. You know, should we shift that wealth or should we just like throw wealth somewhere else? Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was gonna say, um my important query of the AI companion, I ask, were neo books mentioned in the meeting so far? <laughs> And the companion says, no, neo books were not mentioned in the transcript. <laughs> well, that seems like a fortuitous moment to shift our conversation over to the topic at hand, does it not? <clears throat> um, any updates on neo books? So it sounds things? like I haven't missed anything. I'm sorry. Yeah, not, a, not, a, <laughs> not a jot nor a tittle. I don't know where that comes from either. But yeah, no. Um, we we I, I reported in on the junket that I just came home from, <clears throat> and then we started talking about uh, mid journey and brands and a bunch of other stuff. Can I? I'm sorry. I just want to say one thing, not Please. to sound narcissistic, but I just asked what I said, and it said I didn't say anything. What? That's concerning to me because I feel like what I said was kind of important. Yeah, and definitely a part of the the meeting so far. Well, that's weird. Did, can you ask about the topic you raised and see if it knows that? It said Stacy Drust did not provide any specific input or comment in the meeting transcript. Maybe it's just it, mean or biased. It, it may be lag. It it may take, you know, a few minutes to to have what you it's uh the AI companion is working on the transcript and the transcript may be, you know, three, four minutes behind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Or it's hmm. sexist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> something? Well, if, if it's trained on human interactions, I'm just saying. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, I had another really interesting uh, summarization thing, the, the meeting summaries. I, I just processed like 10 of them in a row. I, I hadn't been posting things for all of February. So I went through them all at once. And one of the things it does, sometimes it will use the full names of people. Peter, Pete Kaminsky said blah. Sometimes it'll say Pete said blah. So I've got a friend uh, in, in my calls who's R space J, RJ. Um, so it's like R said, another person is Dr. Claire, you know, whatever. And so it's like Pete and doctor had a great conversation about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, th this may point out too why it's important to practice looping in conversations, particularly when marginalized people are at play so that you can not only supplement and reiterate what they said and make sure they get credit for it, but so that the AI fixes its idiotic bias against, you know, writing them out, out of the conversation the way everyone else seems to. So Pete just shared his uh, summary results from asking the same question, Stacy. So weird. Should I ask yeah. again and see if it's Try. changed its mind? Yeah. Actually, that summary is great. Good Lord. I think it's lag. The other thing, it, it may not, it, yeah. I was going to say maybe it doesn't know. It's apologizing it, to me. It is? <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for the oversight. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, that, this sounds like uh, Chat GPT, actually. I wonder it, if they're running it. it maybe GPT four, yeah. Yeah. So I'm 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 realizing that there, we have been talking about neobooks all along because what this is telling me is 
we should just talk about the books we want to write and then forget about writing the books and just rely on chat interfaces to um, complete the whole process. So well, I asked what, what did I say? It got completely, it, it, it said, I said what Jerry said. <laughs> got very confused. Um, I'll, I'll start maybe talking about Neo books because I was awesome. at a doctor uh, appointment this morning. So that's my, uh, tardiness and on the drive home. Um, I was thinking about, uh, because I met with, uh, Klaus and we had a great conversation. He did a bit of analysis. He used chat GPT to do it. Uh, he, um, uh, the booklet seems to match the audience that we're talking about. Chat GPT agreed with that. Klaus agreed with it. We had a, um, some good back and forth. And then, um, I was thinking about, you know, how do I reach these folks now that we've opened that that Pandora's box? Like, what what's what's a good if this is a target audience, what's a good way to do it? And so I asked Klaus uh, via email, uh, thanks for the feedback. What do you think of this? And he says, Well, I asked ChatGPT. <laughs> and uh, and so ChatGPT came up with a long list. So I, at the doctor's office, I was reading his long list. And um and then as I was driving home, I had this thought about, well, it's recommending do all the stuff that we know, you know, get for younger people, get on social media, do all of that for older people, do, you know, meetings and co-learning sessions and, da, da, da. and it's like, wow, okay, that's, it's exactly what we're, what we're uh, embarking on. And then I thought, and then it said, uh, when you're ready to launch the book, do this, 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 and this to launch the book. Um, you know, tell people it's coming, tell people they can get engaged, get tell people they can, you know, contribute to it, blah, 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 blah. All good stuff. But then I started thinking, are we so hung up on this book idea? The book that um that we really need to think now that we have chat gpt and other ai that we really need to think of what is this new thing and what are we what are we publishing for this new audience because the neo books idea is we're capturing people's minds with the idea of a book but it's a new book um, in a new way that's much more engaging, blah, 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 all, all the stuff we reviewed many a time. But I wonder if, because one of the things it said is there are people, the younger folks don't want to read long form. They don't want to read. They want video. They want audio. Um, and so is there... Is there another way to frame books that isn't even book that needs to, that maybe that what a Neo books idea is, is actually sort of a mid step towards something else. So that occurred to me as I was driving home and I thought, Hmm, is there, is there that next level that we need to think about as a, possibly where we really want to be. Um, I would say that's really a, a series of interesting questions. Um, and it, it made me think of a couple of things in the margins. One, um, we've been really explicit that the book is just bait, but there's a more interesting thing happening under it. And then there's this other conversation we've been having about, well, maybe the chat, you know, how do we hook a GPT up to these ideas anyway? And that's sort of a third interface in some weird way. Um, so I, that when I said, are there three projects here, it seems like maybe there are, and maybe we don't need all three, or maybe we need to think about how to reformulate these for a future world. Um, I kind of refuse to think that books are dead just because everybody's addicted to TikTok scrolls and doom scrolling and super short media. Um, I'm not giving up on either. 
I'm not giving up on either long form writing or uh, the idea that humans still need to interact and create their own memories uh, because we could just hand that over to the GPT as well, <clears throat> right? Yeah. So I'm not giving up on that one. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm kind of fighting a rear guard action here to get us to a place where we have more thoughtful media that helps us mediate um, what we believe and how and how what we're going to do about it. So that's kind of where I'm coming into this. Uh, and I like that. And then, so I wrote tongue in cheek, you know, we should call these idea orgies uh, because that's sort of what we're proposing. We're proposing that ideas need to live and need to be broadly useful and move uh, more than we let them move normally. Uh, and maybe calling this idea sex or idea orgies is an attractive way for some people to come in and go, oh, I want to do that. I'm just joking, but only half joking. Um, Chris, it looks like you were inspired to reach for a book. Yes, I have been reading uh, Dennis Duncan's Index, A History a, of the... What a great um, title. Um, yeah, a clever, and it has a clever index in the back too, as well as a ai generated index which is just dreadful um but one of the things he touches on is he doesn't get into the ongoing issue of it but as people began indexing things in the early 13th century roughly um one of the criticisms is and he uses the phrase at the time, alphabetical learning. So, yes, we don't need to know anything because we can look it up. And, you know, as of a year ago going forward, we can just ask the AI, you know, what is this thing? And then either maybe you have some interest in it or you don't. But doing that means we don't have a common, as humans, we don't have a commonality of, some base level of something we know. So even something as simple as, you know, and you don't notice you miss it until it's totally gone. So, you know, Thursday night appointment TV watching, everybody watches friends and then Friday morning you have the water cooler conversation becomes a thing, which is much harder to do now, or it's much more diffuse or a, a whole season drops now and you have to watch it all that night so that you can be uh, in on the conversations. But then you have to do the social dance of, did everybody get to episode 10 last night the way I did because they stayed up late? So how do you create a base of contextual knowledge that becomes a jumping off point for everyone, much less once you have that, you know, what are the, what then are the jumping off points for you know, everyone else. So somebody nerdy like me may be reading, you know, and it's, this has been in my pile for a year and a half, two years almost. Um, I, I'm reading it along with a handful of friends, but no one else in the world may be interested. This book may be sold, you know, 2,000 copies, you know. Most books don't sell more than 10,000 copies. Most books are down at 1,000 because that's um, how many friends and family they have. Uh, usually... Uh, if I remember, based on some Amazon numbers, I have seen that average book sells less than 200. The big five publishers, and that's usually friends and family buying yeah. any of those copies. Right. And usually it's even much smaller than 100. Um, to get on the New York Times bestseller list, you only have to sell about 5,000 copies within a certain window, which means that if you are a politician or someone rich, you write a book and then you buy all those copies through channels that make those numbers show up right? so that you immediately rock it. And then you rely on the coasting factor of you being on the list to keep you on the list for a while. And it becomes self-selecting. Um, but it's incredibly rare that any book sells more than 10,000 in most first, unless you're Stephen King or, you know, one of the five big name writers, I, you don't, you wouldn't have a print run more than 10,000. And for a Stephen King, you might go 100, 200,000 just to start. And usually they only do that because it's way cheaper to do a massive print run than it is anything else. But 
I, I, you know, not to get us away from that topic of how do you create the base level of something like, um, and in the early 1900s, uh, Robert Hutchins and um, Mortimer Adler created the Great Books of the Western World, essentially as a project of how can we quickly get a huge swath of people, cheap, easy copies of books that give us all kind of a base level of who we are as a Western culture so that we can then continue a conversation from there. Um, and I would say broadly their experiment was a massive failure mm. um, aside from a small, tiny percentage at the very top who, who probably were reading those books to begin with anyway. Uh, and Pete has a good rejoinder. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually I don't, unfortunately, Chris. Um, but thank you for all that that data. Um, super interesting. Um, and and now quickly I'm like, okay, how much money do I have to raise to buy buy five thousand copies? Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, uh, I I actually wanted to uh re reply to jose and and say jose i think you're totally right um i agree um i i feel like we've covered that in neo books already um and you know presumably before you were here so uh so um so i don't feel a lot i i i don't feel like adding to it much um uh and then it also makes me wonder if we've not done a good enough job at kind of keeping the neo books vision mission values alignment alive um that it, that's not already an obvious thing uh, for the neobooks crew um i've got a i i've got a different tack um uh, it's been super fun chatting about stuff and even a little bit about neobooks yay um i i'm still wondering uh i i kind of forget where we left it i kind of remember and i kind of forget where we left it um is neobooks a project is it a process um uh does it have leadership how do we make decisions uh why isn't klaus's book published uh and stuff like that and and i think to that last one i i think we i i what i remember we got stuck on uh, editing resources, and I don't mean text uh, copy editing. I mean um, kind of I idea editing, publish publisher editing. Um, and I think if if we wanted to, we if we had uh, um, if we wanted to make his book uh, a bestseller, we would buy five thousand copies of it. Before that, we would spend some of some of that money on professional editing. Um, if we don't have that kind of money to spend on professional editing, maybe the thing that we would do is just figure out how to do that all of us together let's edit the thing or whatever um or decide that we're not going to decide you know what for whatever is anyway i'm interested about the is this a project uh is it a process uh who's in charge are we all in charge and my notes from that conversation have me have us sort of coming back and saying hey <clears throat> it's a platform of some sort and yep and maybe something else, but it's it's a platform, not a gatekeeper. So let's build out the platform. Uh, um, and that's kind of where we left the conversation, I think, last call. I, I agree. And that doesn't, and I think that's a, a, a great place to have gotten to, and we didn't finish the conversation. You know, what does the platform do? Um, uh, <laughs> I get that it's not, and it doesn't want to be a gatekeeper, but somebody makes decisions uh, you know, somebody's make decisions about the platform, um, you know, and and as a as a first sample, uh, Klaus has a book that he's like done with. He's like, okay, do the thing, do the neo books thing. Um, do we decide to do the neo books thing? Do we decide that Klaus's book isn't right to do the neo books thing? You know, where do we go from here? So I think the gatekeeper thing might have different domains. Uh, one of them is. Most book editors are gatekeepers of content and they have a style and a tone and a level of quality and all that. And I think we've explicitly said, hey, we're not a publishing house, so we're setting aside that gatekeeper role. Um, as a platform, there's a different gatekeeper role, which is like, what the hell does the platform mean? What is in the platform? What do we build it with? And we're definitely that, 
I think we're we're definitely architects of a platform, a uh, simple platform, but some uh, which will connect to other platforms like Lulu Press or whatever, uh, or Kindle Direct Publishing. But we're definitely, I think, in we've chosen that path. Uh, and but we want anybody who wants to author using the neo bookish idea to figure out themselves how to raise the quality of their manuscript, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We're not we're not kind of in that role at this point. Um, so let me stop and pass it to Dave then, Stacey. Yeah, sorry, because I'm probably going to try to make you go back over old ground too. And I, I was just looking at the, and I'm not sure I'm looking in the right place, but I was looking at the this wiki description of what is Neo Books, and mm -hmm. it talks about nuggets, stuff like that. And so um, I know, I'm, I think I'm probably most interested, not so much in the book concept as in the idea spread concept. I'm kind of looking at it from a movement making perspective you know what's the best tool for kind of getting ideas out into the ether um and hopefully changing people's attitudes and behaviors and stuff i guess is, you know my mindset good technocrat um and so the book i see the book then as kind of a tool for that but uh and the neo books version vision i guess i have is that it's the book plus a whole bunch of a constellation of other related interrelated things um and I'm probably less keen on nuggets kind of growing into something. I don't know. Maybe that's useful. But um, so, and I actually have a case that I don't know, Pete and Jerry, have you talked much with Mike Lennon? Michael Lennon, he's, we've been, we've been doing a series of economics, regenerative economics conversations in the GRC. Mm -hmm. And Michael was kind of talking about, can we do something bookifying of that? And I think he's going to come talk to you guys about it. I'm really interested in that notion as well kind of what what would a regenerative economics, I don't know, textbook look like? I mean, Samuelson kind of broke the industry and made a ton of money with his macroeconomics textbook. Maybe we can we could do that with regenerative economics. Uh replace Samuelson. Um but, awesome. uh, <laughs> but but one of the things that occurs to me is that I can I can imagine having somebody kind of trying to compile a book. I think that our media environment is so fragmented that books are useful, but it's kind of like trying to communicate with, with people only using email. It just doesn't work, right? There, there's so many other channels out there that you, you can't get to people that way. So if I really want to have movement making, I have to do multiple channels. So I want to create a structure wherein people are doing all the channels kind of simultaneously with real, roughly similar concepts. So I want the book at the same time, there's a podcast. At the same time, there's a newsletter. At the same time, right? And I don't want to make one person responsible for all of that because it doesn't work that well. So I want to kind of use like the energy of a GRC to kind of help help with the different areas of responsibility and, and things in that kind of process. Um, and I'm, you know, moderately interested in the AI role. You know, it's kind of like so. So I don't know if that how well that fits in kind of with the. Um, to me, it isn't AI driven. It really is kind of human driven. Mm -hmm. It's probably with an AI assist. And part of it is a crowd strategy across multiple channels. Um, I don't know. So that, that's where I've gone. Um, Stacey, can I reply to Dave for a moment before going to you? Okay. And I'm going to reply to Dave as well. <laughs> okay. Why don't you reply first? I can remember what I'm going to say. <laughs> Let me remember. I, I was just going to say, towards what Dave is saying, I would suggest that. Could the next step not be to invite a couple of people to review Klaus's book? I mean, let's review it. Let's read it together, review it, stimulate conversation, but inviting in a couple of people to do it and see what comes out of that. So we sort of went through a step like that. And I think Dave looked at the manuscript and I know that Bill Anderson looked at the manuscript. And I think there's a, a one or two other people who actually looked at Klaus's manuscript. And that turned into some feedback for Klaus uh, for example, Bill Anderson's uh, recommendation was that this looks like three books. And my take was that it's actually one book, but it looks like three books because it's not bound together in it doesn't flow yet as a book with three parts. Um, and we haven't we sort of stalled a little bit there. So I'm, we, we kind of have to go back to it. But we started that. But that's really not what I'm talking about. Okay. Because, because what I'm talking about is more like people that don't even know Klaus not people coming together to help Klaus do something. People that are just as if they had just watched a TV show or just read a book, 
coming with their own thoughts and things like that, more of a social kind of things with where people don't actually, maybe they don't even know each other, but they heard from somebody in this group that they might be interested in showing up. Um, thank you. And we took two steps in that direction, but not the full walk, which is we set up a sub stack uh, for this project. And the idea was to take pieces, chunks, nuggets of Klaus's manuscript and send them through the sub stack so that anybody reading the sub stack would then make comments and so forth. And that would be one way of creating uh, comments uh, in the world that would feed back to Klaus what's up by strangers, by people who just like find the sub stack. That still means somebody needs to find his sub stack. Right. And, th and that's what I just want to say. Not everybody reads sub stack. <laughs> But, but it's as good as any, of uh, given that we don't have a magazine to publish in that has a big readership, um, it's as good a route as any for a group like us right now to find people who want to might want to read this. Klaus also has a bunch of his peers whom he could put this in front of and say, hey, would you go read my Substack and make comments or whatever? And those would be not people involved in this project at all, but people out in the field uh, of the stuff that he's trying to do. Um, and let me go back for a second and address Dave's question before going to you, Pete. Um, so Dave, the, the, the notion of nuggets is one way to try to address a lot of the things you were just talking about. And I'm not sure that that's clear because as Pete says, I'm not sure that the vision of, of neobooks is well expressed yet. Um, it, it could use the kind of feedback Stacey just talked about, but the nuggetization is in part to allow for or even promote a variety of expressions of the same nugget or same idea so that a nugget would say, oh, by the way, there's a there's a video that expresses this nugget over here. In fact, there's five of them by different people in different ways. This nugget has been reused in different places and, and the conversation around this nugget is alive and well in order to improve this idea and, and its, its expression in the world. And then the nuggets are meant to be a way to recompose, to dissolve the book and then reconstitute it into whatever new media forms we would like to generate. So a part of the reason I, I love the, the notion of nuggets, and we also had a couple of calls ago, a side discussion about is nugget the right term? We brainstormed a bunch of other things. I have not been sold off of nuggets. I feel like nuggets really expresses <clears throat> the, the kinds of things I, I like about the idea. Um, but then my track record is I come up with, I, I, I see ideas, but then I don't usually pick the right name for them, but I'm, I'm still uh, like a big fan of nuggets and love, uh, like the idea of, of rolling nuggets up into an OG artifact, like a book or Hey, into new media. And I do think that the exploration of what new media might look like and what an idea or might look like is, is exciting and cool. And we haven't done much of that. We haven't, we sort of haven't gotten far enough down this road, maybe, to uh, to have that uh, that conversation in a lively manner, but I think that would be a really cool thing to do, because that that would be addressing Jose's question of, hey, what's the next thing, and shouldn't we be designing the next thing rather than going back to the old thing and building one of those? And and again, we're building one of the old ones because it's it's a currency in the culture. Everybody knows what a book is, and a book is a doable artifact. And one of the ways of showing how flexible nuggets are is to say, hey, we can do the OG thing, but we can also do the new conversation and be part of it. And that that's one of my clear hopes for this project. Um, Pete, go ahead. Um, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying this, this part of the conversation a lot, um, even though it feels a little bit more like hard work. Um, and Stacey, I, I like what you said about introducing people who don't really know Klaus or the ideas or whatever. Um, and to me that, um, a, a thing that I think about sometimes now when I'm doing AI art and I've got lots of amazing, cool, wonderful pieces to show people is how, how to, the, the context in which you can show people stuff that's cool. And uh, in the art world, it's gallery showings. Um, you you know you put together twenty pieces that are amazing with the help of a gallery curator, um, and then you invite invite people over to essentially a, a cocktail party. Um, you know where you provide the the drinks and the snacks and and you know and this the social conviviality uh, opportunity for social conviviality, and then people talk about what they'll talk about, but they also talk about your art. Um, and go away with an impression of it. So 
I in in that same sense, you know, it, it would be really cool to have a, a gallery showing for Klaus's book, um, in, including you know the cocktail party parts of it, which we can't do virtually, but but that's what it made me think of, and you know that would be awesome. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about me and neo books, um, or actually before I do that, let me talk a little bit about neo books uh, and the rest of the conversations I'm in. Um, we had some great conversations in Fellowship of the Link and in Massive Wiki Wednesday about NeoBooks, um, some of the technology behind NeoBooks, some of the social process behind what NeoBooks is trying to accomplish. So I, I, I would like to congratulate or, or you know, whatever, tell the, the NeoBooks team, uh, hey, uh, we're making a, a difference in the world and we're, we're, you know, we're, we've got a thumb on some part of the world and it's rippling out, um, which I think is amazing and wonderful. Um, so we're doing the right work, um, even if I sound a little bit frustrated sometimes when it's not, doesn't feel, you know, as firm or as organized as, as I wish it, it, it were. Um, so I think that's really awesome. I, let's talk about me and NeoBooks a little bit. Um, the, the part of the, the, the thing that that's important to me or the things that are important to me that overlap with NeoBooks really well is, uh, Dave, Dave put it really well. Um, I'm interested in helping people change the world. I'm interested in helping good ideas spread into the world. Um, I think we've talked here about NeoBooks is not necessarily a book. It's, you know, that's a, a brand that we may have trouble with. We may get a lot of value out of, it's still up in the air. Uh, maybe NeoBooks is talking with a, a, a chatbot, maybe NeoBooks, a lot of it is in a discussion forum, uh, like a discourse forum. Um, I don't know. Um, at, at kind of more scale, I'm interested in those technologies and those social conventions and social discourse and how ideas spread. Um, uh, I'm also, as you all know, I'm interested in, in the tech that supports that kind of thing. So making websites, making wikis, uh, using massive wiki, um, figuring out how to connect discussion platforms and all that kind of stuff. That's, those are my interests, my main interests. Um, and to the extent that NeoBooks and I are working on the same thing, um, it makes sense for me to be here. And to the extent that NeoBooks is kind of a little bit more focused in on, on whatever it might focus on, that's kind of less important to me. And I, I feel like I should, I'm, I'm starting this, this month, I'm going to have to re, um, reapportion my time. Um, I, I need more time to do like massive wiki work um, and other stuff. Um, and I need fewer meeting, uh, fewer hours in meetings. Um, so uh, NeoBooks is on the candidacy list for, you know, am I, am I, is it important that I'm here? Um, could I just get caught up in, in 10 minutes? Like Pete, we need this out of massive wiki. We need, uh, you need to help us set up a discourse forum, you know, whatever. Uh, we need to talk about uh, massive human decentralization, whatever. Um, uh, so um, even though I had a ton of fun uh, at the beginning of the call talking about not neobook stuff, um, uh, sometimes I wish this call were half an hour and we got a lot, a lot done in a half an hour and then we went off to do other stuff. And maybe this call would have another hour of, doing its project work, which is awesome. Um, and maybe I would take that hour and do different project work because I've got a bunch of them. Um, one last thing, the, and, and I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm serializing a bunch of stuff all at once. Uh, one last thing, uh, Jerry, we had some interesting, the thinking about nuggets has been interesting. Thinking about nuggets outside of this group, um, but on behalf of NeoBooks has been really interesting. Um, Fellowship of the Link, I, I don't know if I could recap it, but we had some good thinking over there. Uh, in the Massive Wiki uh, meeting, uh, we're focused this month on getting a couple important Massive Wiki technical features done. And uh, with John Abbey, uh, one of the Massive Wiki people, he kept saying, uh, we were talking about the transclusion feature um, that Obsidian supports that Massive Wiki Builder doesn't yet and how we're going to make it do that. <laughs> um, 
So that's what Massive Wiki in the Massive Wiki community. That's what we're thinking about right now: transclusion, transclusion, transclusion. Uh, transclusion is the ability to put um, another page inside this page uh, multiple times. Actually, maybe you have a number of pages. Maybe you have kind of a table of contents page, and you. It's called transclude, but it basically means include. Maybe you include the text from ten pages. You know. Um, as as a way of making one long document that you could scan over and get the, the gist of the book. Maybe you could take that table of contents page, rearrange it in a different way, um, and then take those same pages and include them in, in a different way, right? And have a different story. Um, John was kept saying, Pete, so uh, transclusion influence nuggets for neo books, right? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and he said, but nuggets, pages are nuggets you know, transclusion puts some, puts nuggets together, it's nuggets, right? And I kept saying no. Um, it, it became really clear to me that I want to make a, a real distinction between the technical capability of including stuff on a page and what Neobooks thinks I mean by, or what Neobooks thinks a nugget mean, to my understanding. Um, uh, this goes back to actually Jose talking about his framework uh, for presenting ideas um, a thing I think you and I, especially Jerry, have kind of skipped over when we talk about nuggets, and it's because of these other conversations I can I can talk about this. A thing that we kind of skipped over with nuggets is that to get them to work together, um, Fonsian talked about this in in uh, Fellowship of the Link. To get them to work together, they kind of need to fit together well, um, and. You know, if you have a wiki, like a Portland pattern repository wiki, for instance, all the wiki pages are about patterns or about something about patterns, and all the wiki pages are written by people who are kind of thinking the same way, you can actually like pick any page and stick it with another page and it works together, right? Um, so a, a pattern wiki is going to have nuggets that you can just kind of mix and match. And that's where we're, where we're inspired to see that it, it actually works in real life. But if you've got a lot of uh, head, so that's a lot of homogeneity in nuggets. If you've got a lot of heterogeneity in nuggets, um, people from different cultures and times and thinking different thoughts and different cultural backgrounds and different to, to Jose's point, completely different worldviews. Um, uh, it's not clear to me that you can just mix and match nuggets well, right? And I'm super inspired by neobooks. And Jerry, I think you've got the, the tail of a good tiger. <laughs> um, I'm super inspired by the idea of like, how would that actually work? You know, um, uh, taking a, a song line from, from Australia and, you know, a, a pattern repository from Portland. And like, how do you like fit those pieces together? And, and I think it's doable. Um, and I think one of the things Jose was trying to say was, well, if you map each of those into their respective uh, knowledge frameworks and you can say, you know, I, okay, I get what this pattern is trying to represent in its knowledge framework. And I get what this song line is trying to represent in its framework. And when we expand them that way, then maybe we can put them together in a way that makes sense. Maybe that's a way to do it maybe it's something else maybe we meet in the middle i I'm, I'm totally making this up maybe we teach a little bit of songline philosophy to the portland pattern people and a bit of um, pattern language to the songlines people and they have they come up with uh, a pigeon or even better a creole in the middle which is i get it i get that we want to express these two different ideas but we're going to use this creole in the middle I, I'm super energized by that. And I think it's also a lot harder than we think it is. And so that was the conversations where I had last week where when we say nugget, I think we need mean something rich and it, it's evocative into a, a future that I, I love. And it's also gonna be a bit of a challenge to get there, which, which is cool. Uh, thanks. Um, that was, excuse me, that was a super useful meditation on our process and your relationship to it, Pete. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I have a feeling I need to go back and listen to that a couple more times later. Um, and one of the many tools that's out there right now is one that sort of breaks things up into sections, like set little sectionize uh, video or audio segment, which like I'm, I'm wishing for right now because like the manual, oh wait, I need to find the moment when Pete started that 
that's going to be like a thing. Um, couple things. Uh, a, I know entirely this is like a pretty ambitious project, and we don't our our, our grasp exceeds our reach by far. Uh, our eyes are bigger than our mouth and stomach, whatever metaphor you care to bring to this. Uh, so I totally get that. I'm hoping we are on the right track and influence things. I'm hoping also we discover that other people have walked this path before and we can include and enhance their work and sort of bring it in. The transclusion feature that you focus on in Massive Wiki is super interesting and relevant here because I can easily see nuggets growing into points into narratives that are quirky and specific through the transclusion, transclusion feature. So, hey, here's something about open books and open book publishing. Hey, here's a, a, a nugget that actually explains how Kathleen Fitzgerald used open book publishing. And that would then transclude in a couple of things that are merely descriptions of, you know, this is what open books are, this is whatever else it is. Then, then it, there's this really interesting sort of floaty notion in the middle of, is the nugget just a marker for a concept, or is it a specific instantiation of a concept as explained this way? Uh, which, by which I mean, there's, you know, rewrite this for a second grader, there's rewrite this for a PhD, you know, explain these things in five levels kind of stuff. Is that one nugget explained at five levels and the nugget knows the five levels? And then the nugget knows those five levels written in Russian and Portuguese and uh, Tagalog. Um, and that gets really complicated really, really, really fast, but it's really, really interesting because the nugget might actually sort of be a nexus of ideas rather than one physical instantiation of a thing. And you might then find, and what's interesting about that is, hey, conversations about open books seem to be collecting around here, and it's a rich place where you can, A, learn how to do an open book, learn what it is, but B, use the, the, the content about what an open book is in your own writings, videoings, whateverings, right? That those things would actually work nicely. And I like that a lot. And I don't know that the composability, I know that the composability is a challenge, like a huge challenge. And I'd love to experiment with it as much as possible. Because um, I, I, I think that by playing with this, we'll figure out what, the, what its limits are and where it breaks. And I'm eager and like over eager to leave the limitations of book publishing as books and publishing have them today with digital rights management wrapped around them with all the different things that are obstacles and and that keep ideas from from having sex and mutating and making their way around the world today like i really want that to happen um so partly one of my thoughts while traveling home was I wanted to sort of talk to you, Pete, and say, hey, hey, I'm going to be a little bit more project management-y about the thing that you and Jordan and I were talking about, about how do we encapsulate the remaining funds we have from the early grant and fuel you to write more stuff that makes Wiki, uh, Massive Wiki better so that we can go play with these things. So I, I, I really want to do that. Um, and... Yeah, it's like they like lenses on onto nuggets. Like like e each of the expressions of the nugget might be a facet or a lens or a filter applied to the nugget, but the nugget still winds up being like home base for the idea, in some sense. And it's one of many, possibly many home bases because our idea of what open book means might be really different from some other group that says no, 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 no. Open books actually means this over here, but the, the but the location of those two next eye in competition around the idea is interesting in itself to me, because then we can sort of say, what do we mean by this and how does it play out? And I wonder a little bit, there may be, we may be, I've run into this kind of, I see it as a, uh, the two kinds of, there's two kinds of people in the world kind of division around um, dialogue and discussion versus uh, policy making or something, that there are people who believe dialogue and discussion is good in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's only good if it's, applied to a context right so it's only good if it's this is the movement making thing so i feel like your nuggets are a pure form of idea kind of that that these ideas are good kind of and they'll mix and match and have sex and good things will come whereas i'm much more kind of i want to be more applied i want to say no no i want my nuggets to reinforce regeneration and here's how i'm gonna and i know that regeneration gets affected by how which perspective people come at it from and which media they use to, which, which media they customarily use, right? So I want to manipulate the neobooks in a way to do movement making 
which gets more people to pay more attention to ideas that I think are important, you know? And so I want to give them entries to those ideas, um, which I, which I think are, you know, I mean, we've already got like, it's, you know, I think you're doing really interesting stuff here around, you know, you like whatever, um, what's his, the, 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 the blogger guy, the, the Twitter guy, uh, you know, I mean, they, you know, they took, they took text and they made it very small. They made it very big. They made it, you know, it's like we've played with text on these dimensions, but you're, you're taking the nugget and you're saying, well, we can do, we can do nuggets in multiple chain, you know, we can do a whole bunch of other media as well as text and have different formats, but it's still kind of, in some sense, there's a core nugget, which is, is the, you know, the, the focus of all these different things. I just want that. I, I don't care about the nugget per se. I care about the, the passage through the nugget to the mission right so, so that's why i was looking for a verby thing let's let's yeah, say, you know there's a flow kind of is there, is there a flow or something so what you just described is a ideal use case of a nuggety ar architecture like perfect and i know that people who are on a mission to get something done are just looking to get that thing done and aren't thinking about the nuggets that they use along the way what i'm trying to do is say hold on hold on hold on in making this argument and saying, hey, regenerative ag is like super important and here are the 15 benefits of it, you know, uh, uh, carbon capture systems that only like try to shove carbon into the ground don't help anybody. They cost a lot of money. They cause shit to get buried underground. They don't help the world. Regenerative ag has a lot of the same benefits and it feeds people, regenerates soil, helps the watershed, blah, blah, blah. It's like that, those are nuggets. Every, every blessed one of those is a nugget that should be part of your argument. And I want to catch them as nuggets so that everybody realizes how powerful this idea is because it's been reused by 500 people, God damn it. And they can, they can add it into their own slide presentation, video production, book, not book, conversation, whatever else, in a way that's attractive and useful and interesting because the nugget is now... A high, a beehive. It's ba it's basically a little hive spot where people who care about that particular thing have come and made it better. So I'm trying to enhance, slow down, nuggetize, uh, deconstruct, but not in a stupid pomo way. In kind of a like, a, hey, how do we actually make the point that these things are su super important instead of having everybody read 20 books that all say roughly a piece of the same thing. Which sense? they won't do because you can never get them to read the same 20 books. I mean, that's, you know, no, exactly. And, and you're always they won't read the books at all. They won't read the books at all. So, <laughs> so what you're saying, Jerry, is you want a GitHub, but for paragraphs, maybe to the length of a chapter. The reason we're using GitHub is we want like a GitHub. You know, and then you can then say, I want, I'm going to build a program and I'm going to pull source from these 20 projects and then and hit one button and it spits out a book and i'm kind of saying a chapter is too long a chapter should usually contains many nuggets yeah. so the reason i'm saying nuggets roll up into chapters is that the nugget for me is a is a smaller whole on of an idea to borrow ken wilbur's terminology um but but then nuggets are composed of, of nuggets so you know the, the uber nugget the super nugget the meta nugget is is like a chapter in an argument or something like that but yes uh and and what you the analogy you just made to rolling up code uh by choosing a bunch of modules is very much the model i'm working on so if you, point... were, if you were going to have a github model that did that would the project level the top level be just an individual nugget of sentence two sentences a paragraph or two or three at most and each one would then be that and then other I'm things. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm following. Up. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I can I can write a program that does eight million things, but often I want to pull little bits of code from other places. So really, you want the the smallest bits to be the big project level. So you know, I have one project, and it's this idea about this one thing, and I have a mil, you know. I may personally have, you know, or let's use Nicholas Lumen's 90,000 number. His project list would have 90,000 things in it. And you can pick and choose which of his 90,000 ideas you want to pull from. 
to roll up into your book somewhere. I think I agree with that. I'm not sure I understand exactly everything you mean by it, but but I, I, the, I the tougher right. part is saying I want to point at X number of things and use one button to roll them all up. Um, and you're going to have to write ligatures, like like books are not just a sequence of patterns or a sequence of observations or a sequence of ideas. Books have narrow. I'm, I'm reading Ed Catmull's Creativity right now. I read it you know, partly on the way home. Uh, it's a really nicely written book about leadership and creativity. It's got a lot of stuff in it. And boy, does it have nuggets. They're just like nuggets of plenty. But it also flows very nicely like a book because he's a good writer. He had good editors. It's a polished book. And I think nuggets don't get in the way of that necessarily, but they require extra effort. You can't just push a button and roll up a bunch of existing nuggets. You actually have to think about them and how you're going to change from one to the other. So you might in fact have binding nuggets. You could call them glial nuggets because glial cells in the brain are the cells that hold together neurons. And I'm probably badly mixing and mangling metaphors here. Ooh, that would be a really cool name for a company, the, the metaphor manglers and mixers. Um, but you were, you're going to have to write some ligatures so that the stuff actually flows and makes sense like a narrative to get to get to, to, to the point of a functional narrative. <laughs> Santa do 120 miles. Great. I, I really like Chris's question because I, I, I think I, I wouldn't describe it as a GitHub for nuggets um, because in GitHub, the the things are too chunky; they're too big. Um, but it's still it is it is a hub. So we are looking for a Nugget hub. And then an interesting thing about GitHub is there's a lot of um, partially machine readable and partially only human readable uh, layering around, you know, a, a tool or a library or something like that that says how you apply this library, what it's good for, what it's not good for. You know, it's, there's, there's a whole set of issues just about this library. And then there's another set of issues about integration with this library and other libraries. So there's a lot of glue stuff that, that lives in GitHub, fuzzy glue stuff around, you know, a library even or, or an app. I, I, another, I think another concept that we have, Chris, is it's, it's more like um, uh, it, nuggets exist in a big wiki um, and maybe the Uber wiki or something like that. Uh, so you link and transclude and, you know, uh, assemble and reassemble and you have different versions of, uh, nuggets have different, you know, versions of their, of the page that they're on or something like that. So it's, it's not a wiki quite, or it's not just a wiki either. There, there needs to be more semantic, um, sem semantic glue stuff around nuggets to probably make them really work well. So, so something um, around maybe well, I'm fr framing it from things that already exist. Most wikis typically tend to run to the more narrative article side, but you want something a little more um, like a smallest federated wiki or a fed wiki where it's like, here's a card and as much as you can fit on this card, that's the thing. In, and then those are transcludable in a wiki-like fashion into kind of larger articles or chapters, which are then built up later into playlists of either by outline or into books. And, and you could kind of subsume it all into what some people would call a digital garden, in a sense, of... Yeah. Here's a digital garden with all kinds of fun little things floating around. You get to pick and choose which ones to make your own outline and then hit a button. And that then spits out your playlist or your book of whatever that thing is. Um, and you could include things like what level of detail is needed for you personally, right? So um, if you're writing about regenerative ag, knowing what soil organic matter is, is very likely important. A lot of people in that field already know it. There's no reason to include that detail for reader A, but reader B is going to need to know the excursion, the little side trip to figure out what soil organic matter is. Um, so that kind of means you could compose a journey or a, 
or a knowledge garden that would be appropriate for each person. Or it also just means that there's links that the, 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 the astute reader ignores because it's just a link over to explain soil organic matter. Um, yeah. I was wondering if there, it doesn't make me think that I stuck in a link to, to a document we've been playing with for a long time about a, a media alliance for regeneration. It's like the notion is there's a bunch of people producing content around regeneration and they're, they all have small audiences, right? And so my, my thought was, well, if we could somehow aggregate all the people, then maybe we could aggregate the audience and people could have a bigger audience and they would get more, we'd basically get more bang for the media production but, buck. But I was wondering, maybe there's an even better version, which is like, you know, replace Fox News with Nuggets or something. And and part of what you're doing is you're you're compiling uh, the, the stories in such a way that they're able to be probably through AI re largely kind of reformulated out in into the right channels for the right people. Right. So one of the things you're doing is channel matching. And the other is your uh, your lens matching. Right. So you're, you're giving people. They understand the way you, they you want you know they need to understand and you give it to them in the media that they need to see it in simultaneously. So you design from the bottom up. You know we we, we tend to design for for TV or for newspaper or for you know whatever. But what if we designed for consumption, really? Right. I mean, so it's, I guess maybe that's my part of my problem is I feel like the nugget is still. I don't care about nuggets. I care about consumption. I can I care about understanding or or actually I care about behavior. Right, but you know how do we get to that end of the spectrum a little bit but i don't know yeah it's like you know build a media you know like you, you called it a platform but yeah let's make it a platform make it uh you know something that uh and, and just to reiterate something and we've gone over a couple times in OGN and uh neo books but one of one of the goals is for these nuggets to affect education science journalism policy making etc so that if, if so, I would love there for there to be. I would like to propose a soil organic matter tax, so that anybody who depletes soil organic matter on the plot of land they control pays a big tax, and anybody who improves soil organic matter on their plot gets that money over to them. This would this would I think tip a lot of people into regenerative ag. It would help a whole bunch of different things, um, and it's a, it's one policy mechanism. So it's from the policy side, but that would have to be based on. A whole bunch of things like what do you mean how do we measure it what do we do and all of those things could be sort of nuggets that a variety of people contribute in to the formulation of this policy proposal and as a community scientists journalists policymakers etc could be collaborating to make that thing happen so that by the time there's a bill posted someplace that somebody needs to vote on the underlying materials are all there and the conversations are there and nobody needs to commission a new white paper on the topic so that uh, deliberative uh, uh, citizen bodies can show up and spend a couple weekends on the issue. We, they can actually, we, we can do it a different way. And, and so in some sense, this is an, an attempt to create some connective tissue and some conversations and some other things to make that kind of thing happen, which is of course, just as ambitious as all the other parts of this. Um, Jose, please. Um, so I, I like where the conversation has been going because I think what I'm starting to hear is that we're talking about means. Um, ideas, as Dave said, or insights, um, and and that these memes would um, represent nuggets or nuggets would represent memes. And I still go back to the idea that a, a meme, a nugget, really needs to be grounded in something. From a from an understanding of what it is that we're talking about, um, that absent some grounding, we have millions and billions of them, um, all of which are just as good as the next because we don't know what it is that they represent. They're just a, a meme, and you could then say, okay, well, let's sit down and figure out what this whether this meme is good, and I don't know how to do that absent some way of of having um a first principles way of looking at it that it, it isn't just a you know oh it feels good i like that meme 
right? Um, but one that actually I can I can look look at where does it sit? What ground does it sit on? And does it make sense? Um, does it really fit within that context? To me, that type of conversation, um, and this conversation has led me to think of, of Neo Books more as a conversation than a book. Uh, that type of conversation where we want to engage in conversations around these nuggets, these memes, leads me to start thinking about what we want is an ecosystem of memes that is that that has the roots to be able to survive within the ecosystem and that the 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 survivability of those memes within the ecosystem both lives at the level of there's sufficient nutrients within the platform within the ecosystem for them to survive but then there's sufficient interaction with them moving forward. So if I create a meme and it, it's not well grounded, well, not well planted, then there's the, it doesn't survive because it's not well planted. But if it's well planted and it doesn't resonate, no one wants to interact with it. It doesn't survive, or maybe it survives, but it never, it doesn't flourish. And so I'm wondering if, if that metaphor helps you guys at all. It's helping me to think about that what we're talking about is possibly creating an ecosystem of something new. And that that something new needs both to be well rooted and to, to be, uh, to have the ability to be interacted with well as well. So it's both. It's 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 ability to to move from where it was created and expand and have get better rooted over time. Um let me take a swing at, at answering that, Jose. Again, you've got like five different great questions and issues here all all together in, in what you just said. So thank you for that. Um I don't think you can, I, I don't know how to have a conversational arena place space that edits away the stuff that is not well-founded. Um, so I think you need to have a messy space where people make assertions, do whatever, and that's the space we have today. It's a, it's a messy, horrible space. I can see that the framework that you're proposing, Jose, could be used as an analytic tool to look at each stream or each nugget or each piece of an idea and say, hey, this, this I can trace back to this, this founding set of here's the here's the foundation I see in this, in this sentence, in this declaration, in this you know, atomic piece of, of idea. And you could also label a different one as uh pure propaganda has been disproven over and over again, but eliminating it from the space of conversation is I think unhealthy for everybody. Yeah, uh, you know, I don't so, think that's what I was suggesting. Good, and and I think that in your framework, there's room for nonsense and propaganda. They just fall into that bin of of what they're what they're grounded on. Is that right? Yeah, if somebody chooses to ground it on some crazy idea. Yeah, this is uh, crazy. This is crazy ass speculation with absolutely zero foundation in fact. Uh, it's a, it's a, or it's a, I think it is grounded. In fact, it's just some loony fact that I believe happens to be true. Sounds great. And by the way, there's a whole bunch of things that fall into original, into religious beliefs that are acknowledged beliefs of faiths around the world that fall into that big bucket. There's just mm -hmm. no grounding whatsoever in facts for this thing, but, but it is a very strong religious belief that comes out of this and this and this tradition. You can find it. You can find its roots in exactly. these different places. It just has no basis in in like actual. It's got a totally different grounding, yeah. which which ha which is a form of grounding. So with that, I, I, I if if that makes sense to you, then I think yes, we're looking at the sort of an ecosystem of memes or ideas or something else uh, and fruitful ways to compare notes and for people to understand the belief systems that each of these things are rooted in and. I, and I'm seeing your framework as an anal as something to apply 
that a few people would write from, like you, and, and you would then, uh, anybody might apply to all writing as an analytic framework that tags up the node. So I, I might hate you and your framework, but you can, if, if I wrote in public, you could show up and say, hey, here's how I mark up Jerry's idea. And I might suffer a lot from your markup because it's like, ooh, this is just total nonsense and hearsay and conspiracy theories. And I couldn't do anything about it because I'm trying to speak in the public sphere. Now, the people who are conspiracy theorists are probably gonna have their own frameworks and will do competing efforts exactly like this to tag everything up their way. And I'm playing this too far forward perhaps, but if this is an open space within which people's ideas are, are, are sort of playing, it's, Gotta make room for some of this. I don't know how much of this. Anyway, Dave. Yeah, and Jose, you're. I'm gonna like stick another one link back into stuff I've been writing. So uh, forgive me, but I do feel like, oh wow, this is you know because I've been trying to figure out this it, it, open infrastructure for regeneration kind of notion, right? And could we build a stack? And I was like, oh wow, a Neo Books platform would be my stack, I think, right? Mm -hmm. In some sense, right? And mm -hmm. and and the, again, the point of the stack was to support, you know, software so people could make, you know, do make decisions or data so they could run it on their software or courses so they could, you know, right? The the infrastructure for me is how do you do landscape regeneration, which is all the knowledge and argumentation and you know data, whatever it takes to be able to take a big, you know, chunk of land and make it, you know, more biodiverse and better economically, right? Or something like that. <clears throat> and I feel like, you know, we could kind of, I could, I could take the Neobooks concept and put it into that, that same space. The the one thing that has come to me from that kind of thinking has been the notion of the open, the open source has to be an ecosystem and ecosystem means it's growing and improving basically. So there's incentive. So the, you know, like the fact that I have open sourced a nugget isn't enough to motivate that nugget getting better, right? And so somewhere in the you neobook know, system, I think you have to be deliberate about incentives is, is I guess where I'm going with this. And, and one of the maybe positive outcomes is that hopefully some of the stupid shit that's built on nothing would die away, you know, just kind of out of disuse. So it's, it, there's, a, there's a rough consensus running code component in here, I think. Mm -hmm. that um that gets reinforced you know ideally yes and and jerry i think i agree with your the, the idea of of using it as, a, as an analytical tool i actually think that it, it could actually be a writing tool i don't know how i would use it as a writing tool not, I, I know not, not I know you that I, I, not you look referring to it okay Bear, bear with me for a second. Yeah. But that you would write something and have the tool say, this doesn't have support oh, in this that, way. But that's how's that different from what I was describing? It would be an analytic and, tool looking at my writing. Right. But not post writing as you're writing it. Oh, okay. As a writing assistant. So I can, I can envision going through your framework as if it were a questionnaire and saying, yes, I believe in this. No, I don't believe in this. I could easily see that. And I could see that influencing how I think and how I phrase things and whatever else. That that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. but, but I don't understand how to write from it. I could, and if it were an AI assistant, if it were a chatbot trained on your framework that said, hey, Jerry, you might want to rethink what you said here because that would be interesting. Right. So you might want to think about like connecting a GPT front end to it. And figuring out how that how that works as a writing assistant that's interesting it'd be fun to think of it as a learning assistant too because you can track how people go through the different ads through nuggets yeah. i suppose yeah and so do a facebook thing but like with constructed stuff behind it you know like here's how people have been successful like through this stuff in the past uh i need to get off to lunch folks um it, we have gone the hour hour and a half it's been fascinating thank you for this it's been super helpful um more later. Thanks all. Yeah, Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Talks. Whoever needed to be here was here. It was very strange. <laughs> the magic of the ecosystem. Mwah.